And here are the convective activity we get from CMAX product. We can see that the highest DBZ is 60 DBZ of convective plots. And the time range, the convective activity detected 96 minutes before the occurrence of seed response until the latest 80 minutes after the seed response occurrences. With the distance, the farthest distance of the convective activity detected is 21.5 kilometers. Convective activity associated with seed response events occurred mostly during the rainy seasons or DJF, about eight seed response events. This shows the influence of the monsoon wind on the convective cloud formation process on the north coast of London, Jakarta. The GF period was the active period. Uh, one minute left. Okay. GF period is, was the active period of northwest, west, northwestern monsoon, where the wind blows from Asia towards Australia following the direction of movement of sea breeze front on north coast Bantu Jakarta. The result was the sea breeze bringing a lot of water favor supply so that it will more likely to have a convective process than during the dry season. There are the meteorological conditions. There were 11 events of sea breeze front that show the decreased temperature during sea breeze front events, which, which generally occurred between 12 and 13, and the decreased temperature caused by the cold air mass from oceans. Use, uh, Mostly, the Cypress Front events occurred during maximum air temperature when surface air temperature was more than 30 Celsius degree. Here are the dominant wind direction. Um, the conclusion, Cypress Front events on north coast of Jakarta, Banten in 2018 can be detected using Doppler weather radar. I'm sorry. Cypress Front mostly detected during rainy season, which is the GF period and occurred at 3.31 until 4.43 UTC. Range of duration 3.9 until 4.5 hours. Length between 36.6 until 45.3 kilometers and column height reaching 0.58 until 0.7 kilometers and intro to mainland as far as 8.2 until 14.6 kilometers. The Sibirisron phenomenon caused convective cloud formation around the Sibirisron area, both before and after the extinction of Sibirisron. And in general, the onset Sibirisron was when the air temperature reached the maximum value. The existence of radar limitations such as clutter and limited radar coverage from surface have a significant effect on identification of Sibirisron events. Therefore, quality control data is needed to minimize the clutter around the radar, and also a combined of analysis using weather satellite and numerical weather model to complement the limited availability of observational data. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Get back to moderator. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dia. Uh, very good uh, presentation. So for participant, if you have a question, please text your question in the chat room, and uh, Mrs. Dia will answer for with a uh, chat too. So uh, if the presenting still happen, still going, you can uh, ask uh, directly in chat room. Okay. Thank you. Okay. For the next question, uh, for the next participant, next presenter, uh, we have a uh, Risianto. So, yeah, I'm here. Okay. So are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. So time is yours, Ms. Rianto. Ms. Uh, Rianto. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, can you see it? Okay. Uh, let me start. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rianto. I'm from Lapan. So my research uh, title is background optical depth correction over urban areas to improve land aerosol retrieval from Himawari age. Uh, yeah, this is the background. Here I would like to emphasize the importance role of aerosol in a climate system. Yeah, based on the IPCC report, it mentioned that quantitative estimation of aerosol effects on climate change are still uncertain. And this to reduce the un uncertainty, uh, much more research on aerosol is highly required. And this includes the better methods to measure aerosol optical and its physical properties. And to date, many satellite aerosol algorithms have been developed. And one conventional method uh, that commonly used to 
retrieve the aerosol from geostationary satellites by using the clear sky composite method. And in this method, uh, it is assumed that background aerosol optical depth uh, close to zero, and this will uh, generate larger surface reflectance, especially over urban area. And yeah, where the pollution or natural source aerosol is persistent for long term. So this study would propose a correction for this BOD value to be applied for EOD retrieval, uh, yeah, primary of urban area in Indonesia. Uh, this is the basic principle of how aerosol is uh, retrieved from satellite. So the purpose of the algorithm is to uh, obtain the reflectance from the aerosol. Uh, it can be obtained from uh, separating uh, other contribution like uh, Rayleigh scattering and uh, surface reflectance and also uh, clouds reflectance. We can eliminate the uh, retrieval only performed uh, in the clear sky area. And so uh, since the Rayleigh scattering can be calculated relatively easy, so uh, the key factor of aerosol retrieval is to estimate the surface uh, reflectance. Uh, this is the data set uh, used in the research. The two visible channels uh, that is 470 nanometers and 640 nanometers is uh, are the primary data uh, needed uh, to retrieve the aerosol. Uh, to perform the clear sky pixel uh, area, uh, we use the level two JAXA Himawari 8 cloud product. And for the comparison, we use a modest product that is surface reflectance product and our aerosol product. And in the algorithm, we perform a kind of specific treatment for uh, urban area. So we utilize the land cover type data from MODIS to separate the urban area uh, from other uh, land cover area. And we use uh, ground-based sun photometer data uh, provided by Aeronet uh, uh, to perform the validation. Yeah, this is the flow chart of uh, EOD retrieval. Uh, I separate the, this procedure into three steps. So the, the first step is to determine the surface reflectance. The second step is uh, in the offline process is to develop the lookup table. And the last step is to uh, retrieve or convert the aerosol retrieval to the aerosol optical depth. Yeah, the procedure starts from the data collection and uh, we perform the clear sky pixel selection. And yeah, the retrieval only perform on the clear sky area. And from that reflectance, we, we uh, generate the semi-surface reflectance by uh, utilizing the lookup table uh, from the uh, radiative sample model calculation and by assuming the background optical uh, depth condition. And from this semi-surface reflectance, we can uh, calculate the actual uh, surface reflectance by uh, method that I mentioned before, that is uh, 30 days minimum uh, reflectance. And we can calculate the aerosol reflectance. Uh, so then we can uh, use another lookup table uh, that have been uh, pre-computed in the offline process. And yeah, we can convert the aerosol reflectance to aerosol optical depth. Uh, this is the method in more detail. So the first step is surface reflectance determination. Uh, yeah, there are two basic assumptions here that the surface condition didn't change during the certain period. And we use 30 days period and at least one day for the previous 30 days is free from aerosol. So the surface reflectance is retrieved from a minimum value, assuming a background aerosol optical depth of uh, 0.02. So this is the default value for the background aerosol optical depth. And uh, we perform this uh, specific treatment uh, for uh, urban area. Uh, we uh, propose a modification of uh, this background aerosol value. And also we only uh, assuming a uh, urban type aerosol for uh, urban area. This is the second step that we have to build a lookup table. Uh, here we develop the lookup table by uh, trans uh, radiative sample model uh, using the SB dot code, and we assume the aerosol model uh, by uh, based on the database from OPAC optical properties of aerosol and clouds that uh, proposed by Hey. Uh, proposed by Hess et al. in 1998. And yeah, this figure show the one of the example of the SB dot calculation. And yeah, this is the table look, uh, yeah, the table show the dimension of the lookup table that we use in the, uh, we use in the study to retrieve the aerosol optical depth. And this is the last step of the uh, 
retrieval procedure that uh, after we have uh, lookup table and we have uh, aerosol reflectance, we need to convert the reflectance to become the aerosol optical depth. Here we perform a uh, match feeding process. Uh, there's, uh, there are two steps of match feeding. First step, uh, because we have five model, we need to select one best model that um, best the observation. And once the model uh, is selected in the step one, another uh, selection uh, will be performed to uh, determine the determine the aerosol optical depth uh, by changing the value of single scattering albedo. And uh, the calculation uh, is based on the smallest relative uh, res residual, like this, this equation. And this is the results for the surface reflectance uh, retrieval. Uh, yeah, here we compare the result uh, from Himawari 8 with the MODIS product. And yeah, the two figures in the left show the surface reflectance difference from uh, Himawari 8 and MODIS. And we can see that uh, this actually not really uh, large. The difference is not really large. And uh, yeah, it's about 0 0.067 for, for 70 nanometers and 0 0.029 for 640 nanometers. And yeah, we can see also uh, this is the scatter plot of the comparison between uh, Himawari and MODIS. Yeah, it, uh, in general, it is uh, the surface reflectance that generate from Himawari, it is uh, larger from uh, MODIS product. And this is the aerosol uh, optical depth uh, retrieve uh, for Indonesia region. That and we, again we compare uh, the Himawari 8 aerosol uh, with the Modis product. And yeah, in general we can see that uh, the Modis product, uh, sorry, uh, Himawari 8 uh, aerosol is uh, larger than uh, Modis uh, product. But if we look at its uh, spatial distribution, uh, we can see that higher uh, aerosol concentrate over uh, Sumatra Island and Java Island. And yeah, uh, it is what we ex expected because uh, over those two islands is where most Indonesian people uh, live and a lower aerosol optical depth uh, distribute over uh, Eastern area uh, where uh, rural and vegetated land uh, is more dominant. And this is the result for the retrieval over uh, urban area that uh, as I mentioned earlier that we uh, propose a modified uh, background optical depth and here we compare the result uh, with the default uh, BOD. Uh, so the, the table show the summary of the uh, validation result. Yeah, unfortunately we have only three sites of uh, ground-based measurement. So we only have uh, Bandung, Pontianak and Makassar. But uh, yeah, if uh, we can see that uh, in the term of the GFRAC, GFRAC is a fraction of good retrieval, there is an increase uh, from the default value of a BOD that is a 0 0.35 to uh, 0 0.51 uh, that result from the modified, uh, modified uh, BOD. So uh, yeah, this is the last slide of my presentation. So a summary is that, uh, yeah, we have uh, developed an aerosol readable algorithm by using the two visible channels uh, for 70 nanometers and 640 nanometers. And in general, uh, the results uh, has acceptable accuracy. And yeah, compare, comparing it with MODIS, uh, it was uh, consistent. And also the point is that the impact of both, uh, background optical depth modification can be seen in uh, these three cities, uh, that is Bandung, Pontianak, and Makassar, and the fraction of a good retrieval increased from 0 0.35 to 0 0.51. Yeah, that is all my presentation. Thank you. Okay, very nice presentation. So we have uh, still have uh, two minutes for discussion. If you have a question, please uh, write in the chat box. Okay. Okay, uh, if there is uh, no question, uh, we're uh, going to next presenter. So the next presenter is uh, Tien Sinatra. Tien Sinatra, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so time is yours. Okay, uh, I give information again for uh, the participant. If you, have, if you have question, please write the question in chat box. Okay, uh, time is yours. Tien. Thank you. Tien, you can call me Tien, yes. Okay. 
Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, uh, nowadays, the use of radar technology for rain monitoring is increasingly being used. Information from radar monitoring can be easier to understand and the utilization of radar information will be more useful if the data presented in uh, range intensity. Therefore, therefore, we do this research. And me, Tim Sinatra, uh, do this study with Asif Awaluddin, Odin Naufal, and Cahyo Purnomo. And the title is Calibration of Spatial Rain Scanner Using Rainfall Depth of Rain Gauge. Okay, this is the outline of my presentation. Okay, let's start from uh, introduction. As we know, the, the trend for prediction is increasingly demanded in order to provide preparedness to encounter loses, even though it provides a fairly short space of time, only in a few minutes. For example, in a flash flood event, that occurs suddenly carries a large volume of water and occurs in a short water and in, in a short time a few minutes can give uh, residents time to save themselves uh, in addition with the passage of time urban areas are increasingly widespread and dense while green open areas are getting smaller and this poses a new challenge in dry, in dryness system a bad drainage system can cause puddles in an area so the existence of dense rainfall observation data with high spatial resolution and time is important in order to improve the accuracy of prediction results. Uh, as we know that rainfall varies widely both in terms place, of place and time. Rainfall measurements using a rain gauge can only provide rainfall information at one point and provide limited information about spatial variation in rainfall. So the result of development that uh, yeah we are, uh, we developed a rain scanner from marine radar uh, from marine radar to rain radar show that rainfall observation using radar information is able to provide rainfall information with a fairly high time and spatial resolution. Uh, this rain scanner employs a clutter removal scheme which using a clear sky clutter map for eliminating interference from ground clutter to compensate in accuracy due to wide antenna vertical beam, a volume correction algorithm is calculated to provide correction factor by using Pedersen method. And the studies focus on finding equation of appropriate KPA to convert rain scanner reflectivity into rainfall estimation using rain gauge installed within Bandung area. Bandung is one of the areas in West Java which surrounded by mountains. So it is a challenge to calibration radar observation on complex topography. So this is the uh, tabular specification of a uh, rain scanner. We use two uh, rain scanner, uh, Bandung rain scanner, or BRS, and Sumedang rain scanner. Rain scanner is based on six kilowatt band, six kilowatt x band marine radar manufactured by Furuno. Rain scanner is not uh, equipped by Doppler or dual polarization technology. And we can see that the rain detection of a rain scanner is 44 kilometer with spatial resolution 120 and temporal resolution two minutes. Uh, in this uh, figure, we can see uh, for the location of Bandung, is uh, with the black asterisk and the blue asterisk is Sumedang rain scanner and the circle is the area of the coverage of rain scanner. And uh, the rain gauge that we use in this study uh, is uh, showed by uh, the red star. Okay, uh, this table show the all rain gauge during March, uh, we use March, uh, March from uh, during March until November 2020. And then uh, this is the location of the rain gauge. 
disengage network from uh, we get from Citarum River Basin Organization uh, BBWS Citarum. Uh, so in for KPA uh, calibration, we use a range gauge in a uh, in region around 20 km from range scanner. So for Bandung, we use a uh, Lembang range Eke, uh, Dago Cudir Cudir Cidurian and Dayakolot. And from the um, Sumedang, we use uh, Jatiroke, Ranca Eke, Cidurian, and then Cicalengka. And this is all rain even. And this 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 is the total rainfall depth. Okay, this is uh, we use two uh, linear models. First is scheme one that rainfall depth is a function of calibration factor of rain scanner times with accumulated uh, reflectivity at a uh, event at the rain event and then we use a uh, rain uh, scheme to the rainfall depth is a function of accumulated reflectivity and then duration of rain and the intensity of rain uh, we try to examine the rain scanner with two resolu uh, spatial resolution first is for the origin the origin uh, resolution and uh, we try the courses uh, spatial resolution. Okay. Uh, first, we would like to know how the performance, the detection of rain scanner in every rain event. And this is, uh, I show you uh, only one location. For example, this is for uh, in, Chudir, in Chidurian. This is for Bandung rain scanner, and this is for uh, Sumedang rain scanner. Uh, this uh, figure shows that rainfall depth for individual rainfall events. This is for, uh, rainfall depth, and this is rainfall event, and this is the accumulated reflectivity. Uh, there is no rain event on uh, July, August, and September. This is for March, April rain event, and then May rain event, and this is uh, pink for a June, and then purple for October even, and the green is for November. Um, this is that uh, BRS and SRS uh, can detect all the um, almost the rain event, but for the Bandung rain event, we can see there is a, a the BRS cannot detect. Sorry, BRS cannot detect uh, the rainfall uh, the rain the rain event that have a rainfall depth. Uh, above uh, 10 millimeter rain even. So for the calculation of uh, calibration factor of rain scanner, uh, this is the scatter of uh, gauge rainfall data and accumulated reflectivity. For both uh, scan, uh, rain scanner, this is for Bandung, for, uh, this is for resolution 120 in resolution, and this is for Sumedang. So uh, from uh, this scatter, we can get the correction factor for, of uh, rain scanner. This is for uh, correction. Uh, this is a variable for correction factor for scheme one, and this is a correction factor for for scheme two. And then we try to apply this uh, variable to uh, calculate the estimation precipitation based on this uh, equation. This is a uh, in Cidurian, uh, Cidurian band, with band, uh, Bandung Rain Scanner, and this uh, daya kolot. Uh, we can see that uh, rainfall estimation from Scam two, uh, in, okay, but for the Scam two, as uh, Scam two, uh, there stand, uh, the result tends to uh, overestimate, especially a. Uh, the rain with rainfall depth uh, 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 above uh, above 20 uh, millimeter and also it happens with the chudirian uh, chidu apa uh, with the smudang rain, sco, uh, rain scanner so this is with the uh, the conclusion the rain scanner in bandung uh, and smudang have been examined with two scan calibration method based on linear relationship between rainfall depth and accumulated reflectivity and then rainfall estimation, estimation calculation using SCAM2 tends to underestimate, while SCAM2 tends to overestimate. However, uh, SCAM2 provides rainfall estimation of 30% better than SCAM1 
for rainfall depth greater than uh, 10 millimeter. Okay, this is reference. Okay, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you uh, for Ms. Tin. Uh, we have uh, one question. Uh, so, is your method has applied in Lapan or this a new method for for you and for the Lapan? Uh, this is a uh, we uh, we try this method for uh, for this years. <laughs> okay, so <very> we <laughs> okay. so it is a very nice method. I think okay. Okay, I think uh, time is up. So to the next uh, presenter, we call the Muhammad Faisal Ansori uh, is here. Muhammad Faisal Ansori. Hello. Uh, Mr. Ansori, are you here? Mati. Hello. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. If uh, Mr. Ansari not here, I will go to the next uh, presenter. Okay. The next presenter presenter is uh, okay. Satria Kinanjar. Uh, is Satria Kinanjar here? Um, I'm here. Represent my research team. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So time is yours. Okay. Okay. Let's may start. I share my screen? Um, it's already display, right? Yes. Okay. And good morning, everyone. My name is Sakara Ningsi. I'm from the Ponogoro University, Department of Oceanography. Here, I represent my team uh, with the research title, Internet of Things Space Coastal Storm Detection System Design, Using Before Scale Standardization and Sugiant Wave Forecasting Method, Timbos Lakwademak. So here you can see the map uh, of the Timbos Lakwa area. Timbos Lakwa is eight kilometers away from Sayung District and seven kilometers from the capital of the Makragansi. Based on its location, uh, the Timbos local area is directly affected by the wind and waves from the Java Sea during the west season. And the basic sediment is uh, sandy mud with the dominant vegetation is mangrove. So the coastal storms are disasters that cause high wind intensity so that the waves and currents become very extreme and dangerous for coastal residents who have their livelihoods as fishermen. In the central Java region during the last five years, there were 128,000 people who were affected by the risk of coastal storms. So here are our purpose of the research. Of the, research. the purpose of this study was to build an Internet of Things based instrument to determine the wind and wave conditions in the waters of Timbos Local Demac Regency, and from the wind and wave conditions, we can also detect the possibilities of the coastal storms. Here you can see the list of the materials and the method that we use. And the system used a GLFS2 anemometer connected in analog way to the Arduino Uno R3 to record the analog signal converted into wind speed. The GLFS2 anemometer is connected to the solar charge controller to get a voltage input of 12 volt so that it can work optimally. The data recorded in the Arduino Uno R3 will be converted into wind speed in knots, wind energy, significant wave height, significant wave periods, and wave energy. And we test our instrument for about 12 days starting from January 12 to January 23 in 2021 with a measurement interval of 30 seconds. Here are the systematics of the direct conversion and the equation that we use. After obtaining significant wave height data and significant wave periods, it can then be seen the value of the wave energy that occurs at the research location. Wave energy is from one point to another point along one wavelength and wave energy from the average one unit area. To see the correlation, between the BMKG observation data and the observation data from storm detection system, we use the Pearson's um, correlation coefficient method. 
The tight data from the prediction of the Geospatial Information Energy Agency was processed using the least square method to find the type of tides that occurred in the waters of Timbul's local demand. Here you can see um, the results. So apart from the application of coastal storm detection system at coastal location, there's also a website interface that displays recording data as a form of the Internet of Things system. This website interface uses a display created by PT Mapit with various visualization options. Data can display it to the public or in private. On the website display, this coastal storm detection system display five graphs consisting of wind speed, significant wave height, significant wave period, wind energy, wave energy, and wave energy. So the next is the tide prediction. Here you can see the graph or the tide chart in Timbo's local map. The function of the tidal data obtained is to determine the ideal position of the system to be implemented. The type of the tide in Timbo's local area the map is mixed tide prevailing the ordinal with firm zone number 2.51. And based on this processing, this mean sea level is 0 0.013 meters. The high highest water level is 42 centimeters and the low lowest water level value is minus 47.6 centimeters. And the next is the wind condition. This is the graphs that shows you the wind speed in Timbu's Lakadema. Based on wind data recorded by the system, there is wind variability that occurs due to the influence of weather and climate parameters in Timbu's Lakadema. The minimum recorded wind value is zero meter per second, and the maximum recorded wind value is 15.61 meter per second. Meanwhile, the wind speed recorded by the system on January 19 is an anomaly recorded wind conditions. It is known that this anomaly is the possibility of the influence of multi-parameter meteorology that occurred in Timbul's local demand, such as Latina, West Monsoon, and Medin Julian oscillation. In addition, according to the Meteorological Agency in January 20, 2021, in central to western Indonesia, the outgoing long wave radiation value was below the normal line ranging from 185 to 215 watt per meter square. This indicates the accumulation of clouds in the central of western regions of Indonesia due to a decrease in pressure in Indonesia, which has um, cause very strong winds in several areas such as Semarang and Demak. This phenomenon is related to Medinjulin oscillation that occurred in Indonesia and affects the wind speed reading by the coastal storm detection system. This shows that the system created can detect anomalies that occurs in the atmosphere and affect the oceans. Based on the data comparison between BMKG observation data and system observation data, it is known that the maximum value has almost the same pattern, but the value is quite different. Meanwhile, the mean value has a value really close to the wind speed value observed by BMKG. Um, this shows that the result obtained from recording wind speed data by the coastal storm detection system have high sensitivity so that they resemble the actual wind conditions patterns. The correlation for the, for the average wind speed is 70-75%. And for the maximum speed is 67.7%. Based on this correlation, it can be seen that the storm observation system design has very good accuracy with quite a striking difference in the maximum wind speed value. However, the mean value has a pattern that almost resembles the observational data from BMKG. So that for daily wind speed decision making, the resulting data can be used as a reference in research using wind speed parameters as well for general information. So next is the wave condition. Um, the mean value of the 12 days of observation for significant wave height and significant wave period is 0 0.46 meters and 3.86 um, seconds. Then for the maximum wave energy that occurs during the observation is 9,197 joule meter square and for the average value is uh, 493 joule per meter square. The correlation value for the maximum significant wave period is 76.6%, while the significant wave period um, average value is 74.6%. Based on the results of this correlation, the coastal storm detection system has a very good data quality from 
the results of the forecasting heights and significant wave periods. In addition, forecasting height data and significant wave periods only requires one empirical equation that does not talk uh, does not take up much memory on the microcontrol, so that the forecasting height data and wave periods through wind to wind data will be faster and more accurate and short process in the microcontrol. Based on the, on the comparison and the correlation between storm detection system and the BMKG forecasting data, it is known that the maximum value has a fairly high range of differences, but still has a reasonable correlation because the correlation value is about 50%. Meanwhile, the daily mean value obtained has a low range of differences. As you can see on the graph, a high, a high enough correlation and show almost the same pattern so that the result of the wave height and significant wave periods resulting from the forecasting system can be trusted. So here are the conclusions. Based on the results, this causal storm detection system is able to solve the problem race and can become a reference for causal storm warning information for the public. And this causal storm detection system has the potential to be further developed by adding other storm wave parameters. So I think that's all for my presentation. Thank you for the attention and I'm giving it back to the moderator. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Very nice uh, presentation, okay. Uh, I have uh, one question, uh, please uh, write in the chat box. So you compare the wave height from PMKG and your observation. And the observation from PMKG is lower than your uh, observation, right? So I think- yeah, Okay, uh, do you know it is a different location or same, lo same location? Because PMKG using the grid and for the grid uh, ocean, it is uh, uh, very far from the coastline. Do you have a comment about this? Uh, we actually um, use the data that very, the nearest the nearest station from our station in the Timbu Slokodimo. Okay. Okay, uh, that is up. So we go to the next question. Uh, Presenter, uh, we go to the Sela Dewi Ayu Kusumaning Tias. So Sela is here. Yes, hello. I am here. Hello. Okay, hello. Uh, okay, time is yours. Thank okay, you. please start. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. So is it, uh, does it appear now? Hello, so does it uh, appear yes. now? Yes, okay. uh, we can see it. Okay, so uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning everyone. My name is Sheila Kusumaning Tias and I am working at the Center for Applied Climate Information Services in BMKG Jakarta. So, uh, Together with the other co-authors, namely Professor Edwin Aldrian, Suradi Mizani Ahmad, and Dedi Krisnawan, we would like to present our paper. Before begin, uh, before begin this presentation, I also would like to thank you to the organizer for giving us the opportunity for being here. So the title of uh, our paper is Why was the sky red in Jambi during forest fire? So here is our introduction. So electromagnetic radiation passing through the atmosphere uh, may either be scattered or absorbed. Actually, what are the causes of the light extinction? There are several causes of light extinction, such as extinction by the gases molecule like nitrogen and oxygen, uh, ozone absorption, and the aerosol uh, extinction. And um, oh, during the daytime, we see the sky is blue. Uh, the sky is blue because uh, there is a Rayleigh scattering. So uh, during the daytime, the sky is blue because uh, the shorter wavelength in blue light is uh, efficiently, efficiently scattered uh, by the smaller molecule. And what about the aerosols? Aerosol could uh, extinct the light and causes uh, or, or influence the Earth's radiation budget and thus affect the climate system. So aerosol could scatter uh, the incoming solar radiation and thus cooling the atmosphere. And aerosol also could absorb the incoming solar radiation 
by uh, heating the atmosphere, or we could call the global warming. So the aerosol scattering is also known as mist scattering. The mist scattering depends on the wavelength and the particle properties. The ability of the particle properties to observe and scatter light depends on the particle size, shape, chemical composition, and the mixing state. As we already know that uh, almost every year, Indonesia uh, experience uh, extreme forest fire event, especially in Sumatra. According to the Ministry of uh, Environment and Forestry, Jambi, Riau, North and Southern of Sumatra own more than uh, 9 million hectares of peatland. And uh, this peatland fires is uh, subject to burn almost every year and getting uh, more severe uh, coincided with the El Nino event such as that of in uh, 2019. So during uh, during 21st September 2019 in Jambi, there are several uh, reports from the mass media that uh, Jambi experienced a red sky due to very uh, dense smoke in Jambi. So the purpose of this study is to investigate the reddish, the reddish sky phenomenon by analyzing spectral variation of the aerosol properties during fires in Jambi using the sun photometer as part of the aeronet. So here is the data and the methods that we use. So we uh, use the sun photometer aeronet data with the version three, level two, during September 2019. Uh, the, aeronet that, uh, the aeronet data is publicly available uh, through the aeronet NASA website. And then uh, we employ three kinds of parameters, which are the AOD or aerosol optical depth. The AOD is the vertically integrated extinction of radiation by aerosol from the instrument on the ground to the top of the atmospheric column. And then we also employ the Armstrong exponent parameter or alpha. Alpha is the slope of the AOD wavelength dependence. And this parameter is useful to to determine the dominant aerosol particle size. As we already know uh, in the mentioned earlier that the particle size is uh, influenced to uh, determine the red sky phenomenon. And uh, the, the last important parameter is the single scattering albedo or SSA is the ratio of scattering to extinction and indicates the probability that a photon will be scattered by an aerosol particle. And last but not least, we also employ the hotspot data from MODIS Aquaterra. So uh, the methods that we use is uh, to investigate the red sky phenomenon in Jambi. We analyze the spectral variance or wavelength dependence of the AOD daily average in September 2019. So we uh, investigate the whole entire month when the uh, red sky appear. And then we also analyze the daily average of alpha and the analysis of SSA in all wavelengths. We also do the comparison with similar red sky cast at Monterey site, California, USA during extreme smoke fire events uh, last year in uh, last year on September. So uh, here you here we can see uh, the picture of the sun photometer installed on the roof of Sultan Taha Meteorological Station in Jambi inside the Jambi airport. So the location is uh, in the middle of the uh, airport. So here is our results and discussion. Uh, as you can see here, this, uh, this image is uh, derived from the World View NASA during the 21st September 2019 in Jambi. And the uh, pin is, uh, we pin the Jambi. If you look at the graph that during the entire month of September, uh, Modis observed that more than uh, 7,000 hotspots occur. And the Jambi itself, the burning season on uh, 2019 started in August and reached the peak on September 2019. And if you can see the pictures uh, below, uh, the A is the appearance of red sky in Jambi in September 2019. And uh, the right one is the appearance of red sky in California, September 2020. 
here's the comparison of the PM10 PM concentration versus hotspot in Jambi, September 2019. So the appearance, the appearance of the red sky occur in Jambi uh, reported uh, during 21st and 22 of September. If we can see here, the hotspot reached the peak during the red sky, and also the PM10 concentration reached the maximum on 22 September uh, about 277 microgram per meter cubic. It's almost double than the national air quality standard set by the Ministry of Environment, which is 150. And here is the AOD wavelength dependence. This is very crucial to uh, study the red sky phenomenon. Uh, if you see here the uh, AOD in 500 nanometers range from 0 0.3 in early September or whenever the haze is not too thick to 5.74 in the peak during the red sky phenomenon. And uh, the interesting feature of the red sky phenomenon could explain here if you see during 22 to 23 that the uh, shorter wavelength is missing. So only the longer wavelength were measured and retained. This is explain why the red sky was there. Because the, uh, because the uh, aerosol optical depth, uh, the AOD is very high. Uh, so that only the longer wavelength uh, scatter from uh, only the longer uh, wave, the aerosol only scattered the, in the longer wavelength. That's why the uh, shorter wavelength of the blue light is completely attenu attenuated. So um, the highest AOD uh, in uh, 600 nanometers was uh, the peak, reached the peak, which is uh, 6.19. And if you see here, there is also a differences between Jambi, uh, it's it's in A and California, it's a graph B. Uh, there is a large spectral variability of AOD. So the large spectral variability of AOD is clearly reflected at Jambi site with a shorter wavelengths having larger AOD, which is indicating the uh, characteristic of fine mode aerosols. And if you see the graph B here in California, so uh, the spectral variability of the AOD is not much uh, up here or it, it is very it, it is almost no spectral variability because in uh, CA it is likely a mixed state of aerosols. So um, this is the uh, oops sorry. Uh, this is the comparison of the AOD and the Armstrong exponent between Jambi and California. So if you see here, so uh, this this uh, this graph is uh, displaying the September event with different uh, years, Jambi uh, in 2019, and then uh, California in September 2020. Both period is the appearance of the red sky. If you see here, the um, one minute left. Okay. If you see here that the uh, during the whole month, the, the AOD is very high with the Armstrong exponent uh, more than one, meaning they indicate the very fine mode aerosol exists. This is uh, the, last, the last slide. Uh, the most important is the SSA. If you see here the in Jambi, the SSA is almost near one, meaning uh, purely aerosol scattering, likely due to containing of organic carbon or sulfur. And then we, if you if we can see here, there is no sp spectral variability due to the co coagulation of fine mode particles in high relative humidity, which is at the time 88% of ERHA. This enhanced scattering of offer absorption. Uh, that's uh, explained uh, the occurrences of the red sky in Jambi. And this is my last slide, uh, the conclusion. The very high AOD with domination of fine mode particle uh, range from 0 0.34 to 5.74 during peak of fires and a day before the red sky. And then second, only longer wavelengths of AOD were recorded and retained at uh, 600 to 1,000. Uh, Let them is up, I think. Yep. Was okay. IOD and sort of wavelength cannot be retrieved. And uh, the last is SSA is near one, indicated the purely uh, scattering aerosol. Okay, uh, so we, have, we have a question for uh, Pusela. So please write in the chat. So since the fire almost occur every year, 
in Sumatra. This uh, reddish cave phenomena always appear whenever forest was fire. So please uh, the answer to this question in the chat room. You, maybe you can write. Okay, I will chat. I will write in the chat room. Uh, you can answer very directly. I think. I think we have still have time. Hello. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for the uh, question, Pak Risianto. Actually, uh, the red sky appearance is not always the case, or it is not always uh, appear during the uh, forest fires. As mentioned uh, on my presentation, why the red sky appear? Because uh, the first one, it is very high density or very high uh, aerosol pollution in the atmosphere. And then the second one, uh, the red sky occurred due to purely aerosol scattering. Why aerosol could be scattered? It, it is because of uh, the chemical composition, like uh, aerosol containing sulfur, containing sulfur or organic carbonaceous aerosol could scatter efficiently than aerosol containing black carbon, which is absorbing. So uh, whenever the aerosol is homogen, so it could be uh, influence the red sky phenomenon. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pusela. So we go to the next uh, presenter. So we invite uh, Miss Arika Indri Diah Utami. So Miss Arika here. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, uh, time is yours, please. Okay, Start. thank you. Uh, I'm sharing my presentation here. Okay. Is it clearly seen? Yes, yes, okay. we can see it. Okay. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I'm here to re representing uh, my, me and my colleague, uh, Ms. Riri and Ms. Mareta, um, talking about the effect of ozone precursor on surface ozone variation in Gong Kota Tabang and Cibarem. Uh, I'm from the BMKG and uh, from Air Quality Information Division. Okay, this is the outline of uh, the presentation. Uh, for now, uh, a lot of people are still confused about the differences between the ozone layer and surface mm -hmm. ozone. Uh, the stratospheric ozone, or uh, the ozone layer, absorbs 97 to 90, 90 percent of the sun's medium frequency ultraviolet uh, from the sun that would potentially damage uh, exposed life form near the surface. And atmospheric research revealed that the ozone layer was being depleted by chemical release by industry, mainly CFC. And the ozone layer, more well known since the Montreal Protocol 1987, and the protocol was designed to stop the production and import of ozone depleting uh, substances and reduce their concentration in the atmosphere to help protect the Earth's ozone layer. And meanwhile, the surface tropospheric ozone is a harmful pollutant and it's uh, created by chemical reaction between the NOx and VOC in the presence of sunlight. It is not emitted directly to the air and uh, it needs a chemical reaction in, uh, with the sunlight and also uh, the precursor. So uh, what is the surface ozone? Uh, the surface ozone is a ground level ozone or is a colorless, highly irritating gas and that forms just about the Earth's surface and precursor pollutant created by human activities included hydrocarbon and nitrogen oxides, which uh, largely emitted oh. by cars and other vehicles. And why we call it secondary pollutant? Because it's produced when two primary pollutants reacted in sunlight and stagnant air. Next, uh, is surface uh, ozone dangerous? Yes, on health effect, the 
Breathing the surface ozone can trigger a variety of health problems, including chest pain, coughing, throat irritation, and congestion. It can worsen uh, the emphysema and asthma. Also, can reduce lung function and inflame the lining of the lung. Repeated exposure may permanently scar lung tissues. And surface ozone uh, also effects on the vegetation uh, from being able to absorb the greenhouse gases to be a source of greenhouse gas emission because the ozone can stay on the leaf surface so uh, the vegetation cannot do the uh, photosynthesis. And in the graph, uh, we can see that there will be a change in yield between 2000 to in to 2050 due to an increase of temperature with changes in climate and surface ozone. Then why we should be aware of the surface ozone because uh, it, it is a powerful oxidant can impair the function of the human respiratory and cardiovascular system. Also, the ozone pollution can affect the marine ecosystem surveys, terrestrial plants and its role in climate. And ozone is, uh, surface ozone is presently monitored at over 100 gold stations uh, worldwide, including the gold Bukit Kotal Tabang station. This is the surface ozone monitoring in Indonesia. Um, as we know that the, the MKG has mandate to, man, uh, to monitor the air quality uh, based on the law number 31, 2009. It is uh, including the air quality parameters, uh, including the surface ozone in Indonesia. And uh, for now, there are four stations that monitors uh, the surface ozone level in Indonesia, which are in Bukit Kotabang, Kemayoran, Ciberem, collaboration with uh, NIES, and also Go Bariri Palu. Uh, as part of Global Atmosphere Watch, we have a recommendation uh, in, the, sorry, in the implementation plan for air quality parameters that we have to monitor and surface ozone is one, the recommended parameter that should be monitored in Go station. Not only given the, the recommendation of the parameter, uh, the Go also give the concentration target in rural, remote, or urban area. This is the uh, instrument that we use to analyze the surface ozone using the principle of UV spectrophotometer and using the Lambert Beer law equation, we can get the ozone uh, concentration directly. We uh, use these two sites from uh, Ciberem and Bukit Kota Tabang. This is the diurnal variation of surface ozone uh, in Bukit Kota Tabang. The concentration of ozone in all season still lower than Chibaram. Uh, the surface ozone in Chibaram shows value at uh, 12 to 30 ppb, uh, four times higher than uh, Bukit Kota Tabang concentration uh, at the same time. And it is because the Gol Kota Tabang and Chibaram have different rainfall pattern then uh, and many factors then can affect uh, ozone concentration besides the solar radiation uh, and other meteorological parameters such as rainfall and wind direction. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. This is the correlation uh, in uh, Bukit Kota Tabang and Chibara. In this graph, we can see that the relationship between the surface ozone and CO2 has no strong uh, correlation. 
and but has positive correlation with the carbon monoxide and also the methane that also show that the increasing of uh, the CO concentration has same pattern with the surface ozone concentration in uh, two location. This is Port Chibaram and uh, this is in Bukit Kota Tabang. The correlation of CO and uh, the ozone is about 40% and 31% for ozone and uh, methane. The other factors affect ozone concentration might affect the ozone concentration is from the ratio of uh, NO or uh, nitrogen oxide. Uh, this is the seasonal variation of surface ozone. Uh, like I mentioned before, the variation uh, in Kota Tabang and Chibaram is uh, has a different. Your first point didn't display in share screen. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. Is it shows now? Yep. Is it shows now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay. Okay, according to the IPCC, currently the surface ozone is the most important greenhouse gases in terms of uh, their abundance in the air after the CO2 and methane. The abundance of uh, surface ozone is varies. It depends on the troposphere profile. And uh, the carbon dioxide concentration in Golkota Taman has a weak negative correlation with the surface ozone. And has a weak positive correlation with the surface ozone uh, in Chibaram. It because the different uh, vegetation and also uh, the carbon dioxide emission are largely influenced by the high emission of the transportation sectors. And methane and carbon monoxide are the surface ozone precursor in uh, Gol Kototabang and Chibaram. And the source of methane emission around the monitoring areas ca uh, came from plantation and farm. The surface ozone generally affects the climate by increasing the temperature, influencing the rate of evaporation and good formation or to affect rainfall and chemical cycle in the atmosphere. Okay, here comes the conclusion. Uh, the methane and carbon monoxide are precursor uh, to background surface ozone and their roads in pre-industrial times had contributed to an increase in ozone globally. Uh, anthropogenic methane has lo uh, long been recognized to contribute to tropospheric ozone uh, because the methane is a long lived and well mixed in the troposphere. The precursor that most influenced the formation of the surface ozone in Kota Tabang and Chibaram areas are carbon monoxide and methane. The goal Kota Tabang and Chibaram have different rainfall patterns. Factors can affect ozone concentration besides the solar radiation and other uh, meteorological parameters. This is the recommendation for the next uh, further research. Uh, we can uh, investigate the impact of the global change on, procures, uh, on precursor ozone's lifetime and also the methane ozone relationship through the changes of NOx and also hydroxy. Uh, and future research priority should assess uh, and reducing uncertainty in the ozone response to methane through analysis, such as multimodal intercomparison and interpretation with observation. Uh, last but not least, we would like to thank you to the Chibaram Air Quality Monitoring Site in collaboration with NIES and also Go Koto Tabang as a data contributor. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you, uh, Ms. Arika. So we didn't have question for Ms. Arika. So we, we go to the next uh, presenter. Uh, so Mr. Waluya didn't come here. 
we replace with uh, Dr. Pieter Plato. So are you here, Miss Dr. Plato? Yeah, can you hear me? Oh yes, we can hear you very clear. Okay, so it is time for you, uh, 15 minutes for presenting. Okay, that's yours. Okay. Um... So I will talk about spectral weather. Can you, you can see the screen, right? Yes. Uh, it's a new tool to visualize multispectral nature of tropical weather. And uh, my name is Peter Flato. I'm from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego. And uh, this talk is part of um, uh, collaboration between Indonesia US and UK called Equatorial Light Observation, which is part of years of maritime continent. And Nelly Florida and Erwin Mahmoud of BMKG are our collaborators um, at BMKG. Before I go to and discuss the software which we developed, I would like to mention that the uh, spectral decomposition of weather in tropics can be used to study weather and flooding in Indonesia. We recently wrote a paper in 2020 um, on social media and newspaper reports uh, and use of those social media and newspaper reports to study floods in Sumatra and it was published in Nature Communication. And uh, uh, the director of BMKG, Dvikarita Karnavati, Professor Dvikarita is one of the co-authors. And then we wrote that recently this paper was selected as the, one of the most important papers published in the last year in Nature Communications. And very recently, a week ago, we wrote a paper, published a paper about influence of equatorial waves on floods in Makassar, in, on Sulawesi. And we also have several, several uh, um, co-authors from, um, from the MKG and one from University of Andalas, uh, Marzuki. So what is the spectral weather? The spectral weather is a software, maybe at the very end, I will have a short demonstration of it, which uses uh, ECMWF data to analyze meteorological fields such as wind, temperature, both atmospheric and oceanic. We are using streamlets, which you cannot see here, but maybe I can demonstrate it. And the software allows to overlay some filter, scalar, and vector data. There is, uh, before there was a, a work by Cameron Beccaria called Null Earth, which is still available. Many of you may be, um, may be familiar with it. So in tropics, there are waves. Uh, many of you mentioned the Madden Julian oscillation today, but there are other waves. There are waves such as equatorial Rossby waves, Kelvin waves, um, gravity waves, and they are filtered by using uh, frequency and zonal wave number decomposition. Um, typically, one would use uh, outgoing long wave radiation or precipitation fields to filter those waves. And MJI is uh, um, large-scale phenomena, but things like Kelvin waves, as you can see, they have uh, different frequencies that MJR, um, higher frequencies. So their passage over, say, Sumatra or, or um, Sulawesi or Borneo uh, can be a day or two. Uh, so we decompose those fields, like any fields into trend and seasonal cycle and get rid of those two. And then the remaining field can be decomposed into Madden-Julian oscillation, 
convectively coupled Kelvin waves, CCKW, ER, which is equatorial waves, and um, other, uh, other fields. And those can be visualized independently. Um, so we are using this uh, isolating tropical waves by spectral wave number, number filtering. We are using averaging over latitudes and then um, decompose these waves. These waves are important for weather forecasting in tropics, but typically people only use modern Julian oscillation. So the most important part of this talk is that besides modern Julian oscillations, there are also uh, other waves which are important for extreme precipitation, both in Sumatra and in uh, other parts of um, other parts of uh, maritime continent. And spectral weather is a tool which we developed for training and for research. So um, we hope that one can develop scenarios of um, sp special cases and learn and, and, be a and have the spectral weather available for researchers and students to play with. So the spectral weather architecture, it's a, it's a software which resides on a server currently in Poland of all places. And most of processing is done on a client side. So the data is being, several years of data from ECMWF is being currently uh, stored in, on a server and then the client is um, user is um, bringing the data to their computer, and within the browser, the data is being displayed. Currently, we only have two years of data, but we will extend it to ten years. We are looking at global tropics between thirty north and thirty south uh, around the globe. The temporal resolution is 24 hours and spatial resolution is one by one degree. So as I said, we are doing two dimensional fast Fourier transform um, to filter the waves. And then we have a lot of processing done in Python and NCL using car Shrek code and our developed code. So we are using um, many meteorological and oceanic databases the atmospheric data is currently ERA-5, and the satellite data is um, based on trim precipitation. The oceanic data is based on OSCAR waves and near real-time Aviso sea surface heights. How much time do I have still? Can you hear me? I have 10 minutes. 10 okay. minutes. Yeah, uh, you okay. still have time. Okay, so um, this is an uh, example of this, uh, how we can decompose the waves. And I will try to, to go to the homepage and show it to you. But in this homepage, you can look at total wind, which is here indicated by wind. And then you can pick up Kelvin waves and uh, MRG waves and modern Julian oscillations and equatorial Rossby waves. And um, so let's see um, how this would look at a little bit tutorial of this. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see. Okay. So you can see on the screen um, Indonesia and one can see streamlets, you know, the, they follow winds mm -hmm. and these are total winds. One can move um, move the screen and look at other parts of the globe. And we can go and say, look at, um, in this case, you can look at Sulawesi or the flow close to Makassar. We were interested in this case because there was one of the largest um, floods in Makassar history was 
in January 21st of 2019, we, we published this paper in Monthly Weather Review, which I mentioned about it at the beginning. So these are winds. But if you go to spectral weather and look at winds here, you can, for example, click. This is a total wind, but you can click and look at uh, January 21st, 2019, 16 uh, Z, 16 local, you can look at weather. So look at what's going on. These are Kelvin waves. So Kelvin waves are waves which are, uh, which are, uh, mm, which has only east-west component on equator. So you can see flow through Sumatra and Java towards, towards Sulawesi and then from, um, uh, Papua New Guinea, you can see flow also towards Sulawesi. And here in the middle, there is convergence of, of the flow. So you will, have, um, you will have convection just close to Makassar, just close to Sulawesi, because those two Kelvin, because those waves, the Kelvin waves are colliding. But if you look at total wind, um, it is very difficult to see this convergence here. You have just flow um, which crosses the which crosses the uh, Makassar, this region. You you can you can see my mouse. I don't know if you can see it or not, but you can see that close to Sulawesi there is just flow across from from west to east. But if you go to to Kelvin waves, you can see the more. You can also see contribution of MJO. So you can see that there was an MJO flow in that region, but the Kelvin waves are kind of much smaller scale event. Also in spectral weather, you can look at overlap things like um, sea surface temperature together with say Kelvin waves. Uh, you can also look at other uh, other variables. For example, you can look at currents. These are oceanic currents and superpose rainfall. Um, so for example, here you can see that there was a huge rainfall during the flood uh, in, uh, in Sulawesi. So by this tool, uh, is available for everybody and you can Google it and say spectral, spectral weather and the first thing which comes it's a spectral weather and animated map of global wind. If you click on it, you will get this initial setup. You can go to um, a time display and go be and move between different different months and display data for different months. Um, you can also change settings of different colors um, and um, there is a little bit of documentation. If you click about, there's a documentation about this project. Um, so you can use it now just for two years, but we will extend it for 10 years. And we also have planned to add forecasting. In other words, to add, we have planned to add GFS data um, and perhaps ECMWF data. So one will be able to do the, the spectral decomposition of waves to look every day uh, and use for the forecasting, you can use spectral decomposition of winds or of or OLR or SST and use it to, to forecast weather in, uh, in Indonesia uh, spectra, spectrally. So um, there are some tools like that available on internet, but I think this is uh, quite um, um, quite uh, mm, much more advanced. 
One minute left. One minute okay. left. Okay. Yeah, I'm done. So okay. um, that's the spectral letter, and um, let me see. I have to go back to and give you the, the give you the. Let me see how to. Get. I will stop the share now. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have a question for you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, why the in some part of uh, Kelvin wave you saw that it moved from the east to the west? So you saw in 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 western part Kelvin moved from the west to east, but in the east part in Papua you saw the Kelvin wave move from the east to the west. Uh, as you as we know that Kelvin wave if move from the west to east, can you explain it? Yeah, so it's not. Uh... The Kelvin wave is moving from west to east, but the flow, the wind within the Kelvin waves is diverged, is converges. So from one part, the wind is from west to east and from uh, on the eastern side, the wind is from, uh, from east to west. But the whole phenomena, the whole the whole uh, Kelvin wave, it's moving together, but it's always the wind is converging. Okay. So that's a good question because that shows you that spectral weather can be used to, to educate, that can be used for forecasters mm -hmm. to understand what are the waves. And we prepared several scenarios and have presentation during the European Geophysical Union, and also there will be a presentation during WML uh, S2S forecasting by um, Thierry Lafar from Meteo France. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Plato. Uh, time is up. So we next uh, to next agenda. So we invite the convener. So first, a uh, convener is a. Uh, Miss Doctor uh, Yunus Warinato, uh, can you still hear? Yeah. Okay. So it is a time for you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Okay. Firstly, firstly, I would like to ask the first presenter, Miss Tia. Hello, Miss Tia. Hello, Miss Tia. Still here. So, convener will give you some comment to increase your uh, uh, some research. Yes, I'm here, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, according to your re, uh, research result, yeah, how fast the SPF even move to another direction? <coughs> Sorry, especially uh, when the the SPF uh, even move to the land. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, sir. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once again, um, how fast and far? Yeah, how fast and how far the SPF even move to another direction, especially move to uh, inland? Oh, I see. So I haven't, I haven't counted that yet. Okay. So I have, I don't know uh, the speed of the movement of the beast front. I only count how far the beast front can get to the land. Mm -hmm. And I think the difference, uh, the speed is different for each event of the beast front. But thank you very much for your question. Maybe uh, I will research more about that, sir. Okay. Uh, once, once another uh, question. What do you hope? Who will use your result? Oh, uh, I really hope for. I think it will be forecaster, because there in my research I have a result where Sibris front tends to 
reoccur or occur the following days or continuously. So it will be very good for a forecaster because uh, when there are uh, when there is a series front event, then the forecaster will uh, uh, forecast or can predict about how about tomorrow there uh, there will be um, opportunity. I mean possibility that uh, will uh, use that data as their data to make forecast. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Tia. Further, I would like to invite Mr. Rianto. Hello, Mr. Rianto. Yeah, Hello, uh, yeah, yeah, I saw you. Why Himawari and Modis data have different results? in okay. your uh, research in your result yeah okay uh, thank you for the question but Yunus. yeah uh yeah basically we have uh, yeah, of course we have a different algorithm and yeah uh we expect that uh <laughs> the difference is not too far and yeah in the result uh in general the himawari is larger larger than uh Modis data, maybe I, I maybe I, I uh, bit, uh, I, I, I think it, uh, this is because of uh, uh, selection of the cloud free is not really good in my algorithm. So I, I just use the product from uh, Himawari H and, and the challenge in the retrieval of aerosol in Indonesia is that uh, many clouds uh, contain uh, uh, in the data. So maybe the separation of the cloud uh, is not properly done in my uh, algorithm. So yeah, this is uh, be my homework, I think. Uh, yeah, that's why uh, the aerosol optical depth uh, retrieve from my algorithm is uh, higher than Modis uh, maybe. Okay, thank you. Now, Miss Tin Sinatra. Hello, Miss. Hello. Tin. Okay, thank you. Uh, according to your experience, why did you use rainfall depth of rain gauges instead of weather radars to calibrate the rain scanner? If I have if I haven't mistaken. Rain scanner is looks like a, a rainfall radar. Thank you. Uh, because a rain scanner is uh, different with a weather radar. Weather radar uh, have a vertical beam width, uh, narrow vertical beam width. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, hear my voice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so for uh, because we want to. Uh, calculate the estimation precipitation. So we try to uh, compare it with rain gauge. Mm -hmm. Because of the resolution of a uh, rain gauge, res time resolution of rain gauge data and uh, Santanu is different. Uh, rain, uh, we use rain gauge resolution time for time re uh, resolution for rain gauge data is uh, five, five minutes. And the time uh, spatial uh, time resolution for Santanu is, uh, I'm sorry, rain scanner is uh, two minutes. So we uh, try to another method uh, with uh, rainfall depth because rainfall depth is uh, calculate uh, accumulated refractivity in uh, one rain event. Mm -hmm. So that's why we try to use that method. But, but I think uh, there are also, there was also, um, uh, different um, use uh, because uh, rain gets in the surface, but uh, uh, rain scanner in the atmosphere. Uh, yes. Uh, so you have but, to correlate each other. But uh, because uh, the vertical the vertical beam width of the rain scanner is so wide, so yeah. uh, it. It will uh, scan from from ground until uh, the the uh, what's, uh, 
certain elevation in one in one in one scanner in one rotation okay thank you the next should be miss satria oh uh, yes sir i do want to know but uh, what kind of sugianto with prediction is uh, something like application or model or procedure also or, and others uh yeah so it's 12 o'clock this again the way of prediction is basically um a wave prediction that based on the beaver skill it used the wind speed and it and then it converts the wind speed to the significant wave height and the significant wave period data okay uh, during your presentation you you inform that the the wind speed is different between lanina monsoon and others even it is true um yes sir yeah but unfortunately you uh, you did not show the data Okay, but and the last question for you. If, oh, yes, sir. Uh, I saw that the prediction with prediction of PMKG that be different with the uh, in situ observation according your research. Yes, yeah. So so um, what is your thinking yeah yeah so we actually use the model data from bmkg so uh, i think that's that's why the data is quite different but uh, what we want to um to make clear that the correlation is still um above 50 percent so that uh we think that our data that we um, record in in situ is still um, accurate. Okay, thank you, Miss Satria. And right now, I would like to invite Miss Sela. Yes, Payunos. Yeah. Okay, Sela. Uh, why there was a lack? time between the peak of hotspot even and the peak of pm10 observation uh thank you for the question uh so actually the um the hotspot uh have a one day corre correlation with the pm10 uh what happened in jambi it was the peatland fire so the peatland fire it uh the Pit fuel burns underground, and it is a smoldering uh, phase. So uh, it it takes a time. Uh, it takes a time to emit uh, the aerosol or or the PM10 concentration. And then uh, besides that, the PM10 it's uh, have have a very very small particles, and then it could be uh, transported. Uh, to different area that's why it is I have a one day like or a one day like uh, recorded yeah further uh, what is the color relation between the red sky colors and the dense of aerosol yes so uh, whenever we have a very high aerosol pollution in the atmosphere especially in a very high relative humidity and the uh, and the and the fuel of the fire is coming from the peatland fires so it may create the aerosol in homogeneous uh, condition so the aerosol the fine mold particle of aerosol will be coagulated because aerosol has uh, the hygroscopic uh, properties so that it yeah. Made, uh the high, the longer wavelength uh, effectively scatter by the aerosol instead of the shorter wavelength 
That's why uh, longer wavelength in red light appear uh, more prominent than uh, the blue wavelength. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ella. Thank you, Pak Yunus. Uh, the last I think I would like to ask Arika, Miss Arika. Yeah. Yes, Pak Yunus. Yeah, please. Okay. Is there any correlation between uh, the surface ozone with the weather condition? Oh, yes. Weather uh, condition. Uh, uh, I mean, in a short time. In a short time, yes. Uh, because the ozone concentration is uh, in, uh, influenced by the wind direction, the wind. Uh, uh, also the UV uh, radiation from the sun, and also uh, it can increase the temperature also, the surface uh, in a short time uh, monitoring. Okay. okay, the next, the pattern of the grab during dry season and during a wet season is a uh, fully different, yeah. Yes. Uh, why the differences between Kota Tabang data and Cipirum data very high when uh, during during dry season? Yeah, it's uh, because the Cipirum and the Golko Tabang has a different pattern of rainfall. I think the, the uh, I don't know exactly, but uh, in uh, Golko Tabang has monsoonal uh, pattern, if I'm not mistaken. And in Chibaram, uh, usually has peak of rainfall in the April. If uh, so uh, in Kota Tabang, uh, the rainfall is not affects much to the surface ozone, but in Chibaram, it uh, affects more than Kota Tabang. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Miss Arika. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. I did. did like uh, something here. Uh, thank you, I think. Okay, thank you, uh, convener, uh, Dr. Yunus Warnoto. So for the uh, next is uh, Dr. Muhammad Taki. Ahmad. <laughs> oh yeah, Ahmad Taki, I'm sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, okay, the time is yours, uh, Dr. Thank Ahmad you, Taki. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Pak Yunus. I think Pak Yunus already gave uh, so many questions to the to each of the participants. And for me, I think I will just... Uh, provide general comments uh, regarding the presentation because uh, today we have a very good uh, uh, many presentations from the presenter and also uh, uh, new information uh, from the last presenter uh, and my general comments related to the uh, I, because I found that several presenters uh, provide information, but I think still lack all information of using the references citation from previous studies. Uh, maybe we, you can add that um, uh, those kind of uh, those informations uh, highlighting previous findings from uh, previous studies uh, in your manuscripts. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, I also found that uh, several presenters uh, like Crescianto and as well as uh, the one that uh, I think uh, Sela, if I'm not mistaken, or I forgot because uh, uh, no, 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 uh, Sinatra, I think. Uh, the use of linear regression in the model uh, because the data is to scatter the relationship is i think is quite uh, low uh, maybe you could uh, you also need to uh, find another uh, approach uh, because uh, i found that the since you're maybe using a very 
the, the time scale of the data as well and then the, and the relationship is not quite well uh, and it uh, would be misleading if you uh, force uh, using the only linear relationship using linear regression uh, I think uh, it should be considered as well to, to look at the, another uh, approach maybe non-linear one and the Last thing, my comment is related to the. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce your <laughs> name well. Maybe Piotr or yeah, uh, the, the last one, the, the spectral weather. I think this my one. My name is, is my name is Piotr, yeah Piotr in Polish, and yeah. uh, but I use Peter. Although Peter. people okay. people Peter. in Indonesia can can pronounce Piotr. Whereas, Piotr. Yeah. Whereas pe people in the United States cannot. So my name is much easier for Indonesian. Okay, or Peter. Uh, it's a very good uh, application. Uh, I think it will be helpful for the students in the university to, to use this kind of tools. Uh, we have a similar one like uh, uh, already established. I mean, uh, that we can find in the internet like uh, uh, windy.com uh, using similar uh, uh, display and also BMKG have the signature uh, BMKG technique.bmkg.go.id uh, and and but this one is quite well because uh, you can uh, analyze because the one that I mentioned before is more on the using the forecast data from uh, uh, GFS and uh, as well as uh, DSM uh, WF but this one you can study uh, the one that you develop, you can study the historical data, uh, the the yes, maybe and so it's it's not only historical data, but also it uses spectral decomposition. Mm -hmm. In wind, in wind, it, there there is no system like that. In windy, it is very yeah. similar technique, but they use total wind. But yeah, this is really a product developed for people who are in tropics. And for people who are forecasters yeah. and, and students, so if somebody, if anybody in the universities in Indonesia would like to to get a training or get access to this, I am available in Nelly, Florida. Yeah, uh, uh, she knows she's from BMKG and listen, listens to us, yeah. and she knows me and for many years and and can can provide my. Uh, and I welcome everybody who would like to collaborate to, to, to collaborate with us. Yeah, we can we can do that because I'm uh, from the Department of JPC and Meteorology in IPB University, and I'm also vice dean for the uh, Faculty of Mathematics uh, and Natural Sciences. And we can maybe uh, export some collaboration uh, for the students. And we are currently welcoming uh, people from uh, overseas to teach in our university as well. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's good. Uh, maybe we can uh, collaborate uh, in the future. Uh, but for I think uh, that's all for me. And, uh, and I already submit uh, several uh, for the Google form. And thank you. Okay, okay thank you, uh, Mr. Ahmad Paki. So the next is a photo session. So please turn on your camera. I will take a picture. Uh, okay, everybody turn on. Okay, uh, wait a minute. Okay. Uh, slide one. Okay, cheese. Uh, next, uh, slide two. Okay, turn on your camera. Um, you should see me. No? Uh, yeah, already. Oh, oh, yes, okay. Okay, it's uh, finished. Okay, thank you for uh, part all participants, our presenter, convener, and uh, uh, Dr. Plato for joining this uh, session, and uh, it is the time for times up for the room for discussion. Oh, we, we can come back again to.
plenary session. Okay, thank you for joining us. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Terima kasih Pak Yunus. 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 Terima kasih P